Aloha mai kako. Welcome to what grassroots, what does grassroots mean to you? Um, my name is Lisa Leilani Ka'anoi, and I'm the engagement specialist for Maoliola Ma Lama Lama, which is the Healthcare Workforce Development Center at Papa Ola Lokahi. Um, we'll go ahead and get started. Let's see here. So if this is your first time here, I uh, just want to let you all know that this is being recorded and it will be shared with everyone who has registered. And then you can also um, put your questions, comments, or feedback in the chat or the question and answer feature. And then for future presentations, you will actually be automatically added to our email list so that you'll get future announcements for our webinars. And then if you are um, unable to make it and you have something else, um, another commitment, no worries. As long as you register for our, the webinar, you'll receive the recording. And then at the end of this, there will be a pop-up that asks for your mana'o. And that's where we get ideas for future webinars. Now, if you have to run after this, no worries. Um, we'll follow up with the email in a few days to see, um, to get your mana'o after that. So welcome. So just as an FYI, um, so Mali Olama Lama Lama, we have this webinar series um, and it starts in September. So last month we started our new webinar series this year. And the theme for this year is Aloha Aku Aloha Mai. So um, collaboration and mutual goodwill. And we decided that this year we were going to include um, not only native Hawaiian speakers, but we also wanted to include our relatives such as Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, and other indigenous people. Um, we felt like that would be a more accurate representation of the landscape and the environment that we live in, um, because there are other folks here on the islands um, that are also our family. So um, to welcome you to this year, and then also um, I just wanna go ahead and start with um, introducing um, Chantal Matagi, um, otherwise uh, known as, we know her as Telly. So her academic background, um, life experiences and community connections have assisted, prepared and guided her professional career and the work she has accomplished as a health equity educator and leader. And as an academic graduate and student at the Center for Pacific Island Studies at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, she has benefited from their interdisciplinary program. Their courses in history, anthropology, social sciences, art, language, economics, and health gave her a strong knowledge base that is grounded in historical context, cultural humility, and the ability to create community-based solutions. As a Pacific Islander woman, she understands the cultural nuances of working with diverse communities and it is important that those doing the work represent those communities effective and that community-led initiatives be supported. She works hard to establish collaborative partnerships with embedded community-based organizations, faith-based institutions, medical and social service providers, and community leaders and advocates. These partnerships create educational outreach and community engagement that is in language and culturally safe. This approach is innovative, inclusive, and supports better community participation. When she began with the State of Hawaii Department of Health as the COVID-19 Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander Lead Investigator on the, what is called Team 6B in October 2020, Pacific Islanders, Filipinos, and Native Hawaiians accounted for over 50% of the positive cases statewide. Today, the number of positive cases in these communities have dropped mm -hmm. substantially, approximately 25%. This is an impressive drop and one that could not have been accomplished without the efforts of Team 6B or the support of all those listed above. Under the supervision of Sarah Kimball, MD, PhD, the State Epidemiologist and Chief of Disease Outbreak and Control Division at DOH, DOH has documented and published the innovative practices she created with the support of all those listed above in addressing health equity and disparities. 
She is co-author of the Hawaii Department of Health report, COVID-19 in Hawaii, Addressing Health and Disparities, um, Addressing Health Equity in Diverse Populations, and a Morbidity and Mortality Weekly report titled Disaggregating Data to Measure Racial Disparities in COVID-19 Outcomes and Guide Community Response, Hawaii, March 1st, 2020 to February 28th, 2021. This work was also cited in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization article, Promoting Health Equity During the COVID-19 Pandemic, United States as a Successful Approach to Addressing Health Disparities. In addition to her academic background and live life experiences, um, community connections, she is extremely hardworking, exacting, and possess a tremendous amount of dedication, enthusiasm, patience, and respect for, for health equity work. So we're very um, excited to have Telly, and we're also extremely excited to have Ka'apuni with us, Kama from um, Papakolea. And I'm going to have them both jump on and um, have Ka'apuni introduce herself. And um, for those of you that don't know Telly or Ka'apuni, we'll go ahead and kind of start with them talking a little bit about their background. Um, so welcome, Ka'apuni. Go ahead, take it away. Uh, aloha, everyone. Good morning. Um, I was just laughing. I'm, I'm laughing with Telly. Um, I didn't do my bio, but aloha, everyone. I'm Ka'apuni Kama from Papakolea. I'm Director of Operations at Kula Nona Poe Hawaii, a small nonprofit in Papakolea. And yep, homesteader from Papakolea on Oahu and community leader in training and all that fun stuff. So aloha. All right. Welcome. Telly, how are you? <laughs> Like you said, I don't know when I wrote that, but I must have been on something that day. <laughs> this is not me. No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so tell us about yourselves. Okay, so Papa Kalea, born, raised, Ka, um, and you're following in footsteps, yeah? Yep, so my journey in community work starts with my grandmother. She was a community organizer and was one of the founders of our nonprofit here in Kula. We were founded in 1992, and my mama, Puni Keko Oha, was the community association president for years. So um, I've been kind of semi like dragged guinea pig through this community work life, uh, but now I love it and I enjoy it. So now I'm stuck. So that's my fun story into community life. And um, tell me, what's your story? So my story is I am a single mom of a disabled, awesome young man who really threw me into the thick of public health. Uh, because prior to that, while I had watched my um, Samoan grandparents and relatives kind of struggle with public health and getting access, I hadn't really experienced it personally, luckily. Um, but as I began my journey with my child, I very quickly learned how difficult it is to receive services, to connect those services, um, the advocacy work that is required, and also like just the, the journey, the roughness of the journey. I mean, oftentimes we're led to believe as we're growing up, like public health insurance, it's easy. Don't worry about it. It's there to support those community members who need it. But that's not true. The actual truth is it's difficult to get those services. You have to jump through hoops. You have to advocate for yourself and your child. And not only that, oftentimes you're dealing with systemic racism that unfortunately has created a system that oftentimes ignores or marginalizes the stresses of our communities, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in general. So, um, it was baptism by fire, which, <laughs> which then led me to um, go back to school. And once I was in school, um, I, in a previous life, I, I did a lot of financial work. And then once I went back to school, I took um, Pacific Island studies. And all of a sudden, 
I was enlightened. I, I knew what I needed to do. And that was, I needed to advocate for myself, my community, and for those who have a voice, but who oftentimes feel voiceless. And I have been privileged to be able to get an education and do that. And so I wanted to make sure that I was lifting my community up. And um, I, I oftentimes in Samoa, we have a proverb, ole ala ile pule, ole, oh, sorry. Ole ala ile pule, ole tautua. So the pathway to uh, leadership is through service. And so I have always known, and I hope I said that correctly, my apologies if I did not, um, my, my, um, my path has always been to serve my community. So this kind of just went hand in hand with it. And as I struggled, I knew there were others struggling just like me, and I wanted to help them. So long story short. Nice. And then, so, Let's get into it then. What does Kaapuni, what does grassroots mean to you? Um... Okay, so I want to be honest, right? So I had to Google that because <laughs> I'm not used to that term grassroots. Um, yep, there you for, go. For me, I'm just, I'm more used to the term community, right? And community based, community driven, which I think means kind of the same thing, right? It's, it's the most organic group of people from a community on the ground level that is advocating for themselves and saying, this is what we need. And this is what's happening to us and really identifying and, and driving what happens uh, in our space into our communities with our communities. And so that was, uh, the, the term grassroots is different for me, but that to me is kind of the same, um, just, you know, at this level, it's it's the workers and it's the people who um, are doing the work, but also being directly affected that are communicating our needs and, and how we would like to be served. So that was the easy definition for me. Mahalo, how about you, Telly? Well, I was uh, born and raised in Utah around a bunch of farms. So I understood that grassroots <laughs> from that perspective meant those who are on the ground, boots on the ground, doing the work, and um, then providing for others. So when I think about grassroots, what I think about is those community members who every day wake up, go to work, provide for their families, put, um, out there grinding away, um, and oftentimes are not seen. They're just part of the cogs, right? And we, we just assume that things are gonna keep going because somebody out there is doing the work. And those are, to me, are really the grassroots. And then of course, as I moved to Samoa and then to Hawaii, what I've understand and been able to incorporate is from my Pacific background. Again, this is about understanding that I'm a part of something larger than myself. I have a responsibility to me and to my family, but also to my extended family to the community that I live in and to the state that I'm a part of. And I think with that, that lends itself to grassroots because again, that recognizes that even the granular, the smallest portion of the cog is an important piece and that they need to be supported and that their work needs to be amplified and acknowledged, so. I hope that made sense, <laughs> but that's that's what I think of when I think of grassroots. Mahalo. So um, I guess, um, you know, one of the questions would be like, um, you know, what are the unique challenges, of course, we have living in Hawaii? And also, you know, how do we get a seat at the table? How, how does how how do we know when to get a seat try to fight for a seat at the table or how when we make our own table you know um and you know how much of that requires backup you know and how much of that is something you have to forge new ground on like be a trailblazer okay i'll go first this time oh uh, when i'm thinking about that really what i think about is Sometimes you take journeys on your own and sometimes you take journeys with others. Um, 
doing this kind of work means creating a pathway. And I think as Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians, we have traditional or cultural pathways, but we need to find ways to incorporate those traditional or cultural pathways into Western systems. And um, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about COVID-19, of course, because that's the most recent pandemic. And that's something that Pacific Islanders and Native Hawaiians have suffered because of. And we suffered mainly because normal public health strategies were not working. And they weren't working because they weren't inclusive of our language or our culture. And so what it took was an expansion of their normal processes, such as the hiring of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander staffing in order to create that, and then adjusting the system so that that way when a Pacific Islander a Samoan, a Tongan, a Chukis, a Marshallese, wherever they were from, were affected by COVID, they received a call from somebody that spoke their language, understood their situation, and could offer appropriate resources. Because one of the things that we understand, especially as we watched our grandparents struggle to speak English, is that our communities have rote answers. We say yes because we don't want to be seen as a burden. But is that true? No. When we are asked how many people are in our home, we say me. Why? Because we don't want anybody judging us because we live in, in multi-generational homes. And so, um, so I think this is really creating space for Indigenous knowledge and Indigenous ways, but also fixing a system that has been broken for far too long. Um, and I hate using the word health equity, not because it's a bad word, but because it's become like the buzzword. You know, everybody uses it now because they want to, oh, we're doing health equity. That's great. But can I see your plan for how you plan to implement health equity? And can I see the workers that you are hiring to do that work? Do they represent those communities? Are they going to be most effective in appropriately engaging those communities? And um, I may sound like a broken record at this point because we say this a lot, but I, I think the more we repeat it, the more we know, normalize it. And unfortunately, oftentimes, those of us who are kind of at the forefront, we are leading those paths, uh, leading this fight. I hate to use the word fight. We are leading this fight. And, and it's because it's important and it's because it's necessary. And it's because this is what our communities require. So Mahalo. Kaupuni. So I, I think for that question, um, as as a homesteader, as a community-based organization, um, that comes with if you start to define what are your needs, you kind of have to look at the tables, right? We're talking about the tables and our, our ED, our fearless leader, Adrian Diller, she's famous for, you know, her, her and her partner in crime, my mama are famous for flip the table and make your own table. They, they all love that stuff. But, um, you know, I think back to Kula 30 years ago, right? When we were just a very small organization that just wanted to address test scores of children, right? That, is, is something that we could do, you know, fairly, fairly um, just within community. We didn't need a lot of partners. We didn't need a very big table. That was something that we wanted to focus on, parent engagement, right, children's education. And then as we start to identify, okay, we wanna look at health. We wanna look at research. That starts to change the tables that we look at. And we have had to grow as we, started to look around, but I think the power of, of the grassroots is that you identify where you wanna go and what you wanna do and the tables that you sit at. I think for community, a lot of the times, you know, there are so many people, especially for community-based um, organizations that are starting to do the work. There's so many people who come in and are like, we're doing this and we're doing that. And then we start to get distracted from what we want and what we've defined as our needs versus, you know, 
somebody over here is doing this. Let's jump on that. And, and it's usually tied to funding, right? Unfortunately, it, it all costs money. All of this costs, somebody got to pay for the work that we do. Um, so I think the table conversation as community-based organizations grow, we start to be able to kind of pick the tables that we're at and really look at those partnerships that are most helpful for us and both ways, right? We also wanna help our partners. Like I think of um, the Department of Native Hawaiian Health. That's been an amazing partnership and relationship over the years that has grown that I think has, has helped both sides, right? And that's also important because we should both be benefiting from our partnerships and relationships and growing together, right? So, and then, you know, now Kula has come to a space where we can decide not to join a table and that takes a very long time and it takes a lot of relationships um, and partnerships to do. But those are the kind of places that I think communities we want to get to. We want communities to identify, you know, what tables we sit at and what tables maybe we got to pass, right? And and for, for ourselves and for the people that we serve, um, that's really important. So yeah, I think when we think about the tables conversation, um, that's important. That's very important for us on the community level. And can I add to that, Lisa, one last thing? I think what's also important to point out is the table that the Native Hawaiians of Pacific Islanders created during the COVID-19 pandemic to assist each other. Like oftentimes we're pitted against each other by government systems, unfortunately, because there's a limited financial pot. You know, we're all fighting for those same pieces of coin. And unfortunately, that doesn't necessarily lead to collaborative partnerships. And what we recognize during COVID-19 is we occupy the same spaces. So if we are able to support each other and lift each other up, then we are also supporting our community at large. This is, of course, the Native Hawaiian homeland. And we as Pacific Islanders are very grateful that we have been able to be a part of, participate, live, grow, have our families here. And what an honor it is for us to share the table with them and to also move forward with them. Because again, we're all in, we're all in this together. And I don't mean that in a hokey sense, uh, but I mean that we all, we share the same cultural values, we, say, we share the same spaces, and however we can lend a hand to each other, I think that that's important. So I, I love that table and I love that I'm able to sit at it. Oh, that wasn't hokey at all. I wanna give you a hug now, make me cry. <laughs> no, but I mean, it's true. And honestly, um, if I'm gonna be honest, this is the reason why our, department decided to go with the, um, including Pacific Islanders, American Indians, um, Indigenous peoples, because the NHPI 3R response was so positive and so impactful. That was the first time we all had to force, we were forced to work together in the same spaces and it worked, it succeeded. So that's when we were thinking, well, we need to follow that same model, you know? So we're all on this island together. And if one of us is doing well, we're all doing well, right? So, you know, we just felt like it, that was just, we had to do it. The, the sign was on the wall. Um, so um, what would you, what advice would you give to folks like let's say not only starting out as um, commu in community-based or grassroots or however you want to name it, what about those that are on the continent, you know, that are really trying to, you know, get their needs met up there? Um, and there might need not be an answer right now or, you know, but, that's also another thing we were thinking about is you def we definitely can't leave anybody behind, right? Because we're so um, Oahu centric, we're so Hawaii Valeno centric, right? 
we've got, some of us have family and relatives that are on the continent who are doing their best. I'm sure, you know, a lot of them would rather be here, but, you know, situations happen and, and life happens. And so, I don't know, any thoughts about any of, in, any of that that I have said? I, as someone who was raised on the continent until I was 12 years old and a large portion of my family still resides there, um, I have noticed that this cultural exchange of reciprocity and um, also the revitalization of the desire, and I, I hate to use, again, the word revitalization, but the desire to learn native languages and our cultures is super important. Um, I'll, I'll use this as an example. When I was growing up in Utah, I was in second grade and I decided that I wanted to learn Psalm 1 because I wanted to be able to communicate with my grandparents. Um, it was back in the 70s when this was happening. <laughs> when this was happening. And so race relations were not the greatest. And there was this idea that um, in order to assimilate, that needed to mean that you let go of all that was different. And so for me, um, they, I, I was told it wasn't appropriate to teach me Psalm 1 because it wasn't a language that was um, that would bring something to the table. Um, and so I think it's important that we support those on the continent in recognizing the wealth that is associated with who they are and where they come from. And in creating outreaches, schools that teach language, that teach culture, and that ground them in that. Because while we understand that there may be financial, personal, whatever reasons that have taken them far away from home, that doesn't mean that home has left them. And that doesn't mean that that part of their identity is not important. I have seen far too many people who have struggled with their cultural identity and have not been able to find peace until they reconnected with that. Why? Because that's who they are. So while I didn't speak the language and I wasn't taught it because somebody on the continent said it wasn't worthy of, of being taught to me, I later realized that that was important because it gave me direction. Um, and it helped me to understand where I was going and how I could move forward positively. So I hope that made sense. Kaponi, your thoughts, add to it. Um, well, I, I don't have a lot of mainland experience, but I think for, for me, the, the Ohana on the mainland, um, I only know family that were in Hawaii originally that had to move. Um, I, I'm trying to think in my head if I know family that were born and raised on the mainland, because I, I think, you know, just like Telly said, that is a totally different um, group. You know, if, if you've never been in Hawaii, you were born here or you know, you weren't born in the Pacific Islands and you're kind of born in the mainland. I think that cultural connection is even farther and harder to, to connect to versus, you know, I have cousins who were born and raised in Ever Beach and now they live in Arizona. Uh, I have a cousin in New York, but they were born and raised here. So again, that cultural connection is going to be so much harder for those that have never maybe even been to Hawaii before in their life. Um, but what I, I did think was interesting about when you asked the mainland question, uh, Lisa was, we had just met, I can't remember her last name, but um, Dr. Nia, shucks, I can't remember, but she lives in Arkansas and she has a big hui of community health workers from like 20, 28 states or some crazy number like that. Um, but she's uh, kind of having a group of community health workers, but she was sharing with us, we had breakfast the other week, um, that the NHPI communities on the mainland um, are stronger. You know, like home here, we kind of have Native Hawaiians and then you have Pacific Islanders, but you also have like a Samoan group, a Tongan group. But Nia was sharing with us that on the mainland, NHPIs, because they're just less in number, are stronger as an NHPI group on the mainland. So I thought that's amazing um, to experience. And then she was also saying, you know, uh, maybe she was, she had um, examples of like a Hawaiian family that was participating in a Samoan church, but that was their way to connect and stay engaged 
and, and connected to NHPIs as a whole. So I think the way the mainland is doing it, they are just trying to make it work with what they have. Um, and, and we do need to, to connect to them. I don't know how specifically, but the, you know, for like, for me, it's through family. Oh, thank you, Telly. Yeah, that's her last name. I, I'm not going to take a shot at that, but we love her, but yeah. Mahalo. Yes, Dr. Nia Aita Ota, Oto. She used to actually work here at Papa Ola Lokahi. Um, yes. Mahalo for that. Sorry, my computer glitched and died halfway through that, but um, mahalo. So um, I guess, you know, some of the questions, like I'm, I'm sure folks are, are wanting to take something away from this and I'll take it as a tool after this and go, hey, I learned this today. I'm going to use this today as a tool, right? So what, what do you do? To, um, to, to effectuate change so that it find it like it eventually becomes policy. It, you know, it actually becomes something that gets embedded into our system. Like what, you know, so what I've heard is like, you kind of have to be strategic about being cool A, right? You can't just like coupe everything, coupe everything, right? Otherwise, no one's gonna want to listen to us, right? And so, how how do you use that strategy and make it something into that can come become policy? So, being a part of a government system, I have been told and this may surprise you, probably not. That my passion is off-putting, um, <laughs> and um, that uh, my message can get lost um, in my efforts to advocate. And so, what I have had to do was one, take that to heart. Um, I think in some instances, though, that is used as an excuse. So you have to decide for yourself what's real and what's not. Um, and there are times when you need to be diplomatic in what you're sharing about, but there are also times when it is completely appropriate for you to be passionate. And I think we all learn that, or I'm hoping we learn that the older we get and we're better able to navigate those waters. I also think as a community, we have to get comfortable with the uncomfortable having discussions about race, being advocates, talking on behalf of your community, hearing your accomplishments can be uncomfortable because we've been taught to be small. We've been taught that we belong at the end of the room or behind the table because there isn't room for us and we're different. But what we need to realize and what I have been grateful for is that we are descendants of amazing, intelligent, knowledgeable people who were sailing the Pacific before Eastern Europeans even thought about it. And we populated the Pacific much like others populated Eastern European countries. And so we need to be proud of that and we need to recognize that. That's also why I struggle with the term indigenous knowledge because we are prioritizing and give, putting a hierarchy to whose knowledge is above who else's knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge. If I know something, then I know something. If I do something, then that's important as well. So. That's my uh, soapbox event for today. <laughs> I, I think that's number five for Friday. Uh, but I just want to say that, like, get comfortable with it because it's going to be hard. You know, being able to speak about who I am and my accomplishments is not easy. Like, you were reading my bio and I was low key turning red and just like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking when I wrote that? But then I realized, like, I did that. That's kind of cool. 
but then also like it's also understanding that not everybody's going to like you and not everybody's going to understand what you're saying or why you're saying it but I tell you what you turn around you look at your community I guarantee there's going to be a a line behind you of people who are saying the exact same thing and who are asking for those exact same services so yeah be comfortable <laughs> that was and like be big be big <laughs> Stop playing small I think I caught you on a good day, Telly. <laughs> I'm loving all this. <laughs> um, anything to add, Kyle? Um, I think for me, like, okay, so so the the tip from the community side, I guess, would be to to do the work and do it over and over again and on and beyond. Because I think sometimes, you know. People, people from the outside could kind of connect community to small and simple, right? So, and sometimes, you know, some partners think that, you know, they're kind of doing us a favor by providing services or funding or, you know, um, so as community, like kind of the, the, the way that we've done it is we just do the work and we go above probably what's expected. And we really kind of, it's a bad habit because we make ourselves really tired um, doing it. But you have to set the expectation that community, it, we're not a handout for, you know, funders and programs, right? Like this, it's, it's and, and really flipping the narrative about, it's a privilege to enter our community, right? That's probably number one, right? Is, is it's, and not in like a, a stuck up way and I don't want to put it like that but you have to as gatekeepers of our community it's our job to protect the people that we serve and and the people that are here and so when 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 the opportunities come to partner and grow and build we have to decide um if this is a good idea because at the end of the day what other people you know don't experience and I think especially for CBOs if something goes bad right? If the partnership doesn't work out, the first person to get the call is usually my mom, because why? We live here. So, you know, it's also that. So I think for communities, for homesteaders, and, and any community where, where your people live, where you work, right? And so the, the people in my programs and the after school programs live two doors away from me. That's a totally different level of grassroots, right? That's a different brand. But for those of us, and, and I'm speaking really for the homestead associations, that's how we have to do it, right? It's homesteaders. But if we're doing something that people don't agree with, you can walk to my house essentially and like we could talk about it in my garage, right? So that's just kind of the, the other way. And, and so we have to kind of set the bar and in moving forward. And that's kind of, I don't know if it's like a trip for policy, but um. That, that would be my thing for CBOs out there that are trying to, you know, gain momentum. Um, we got to be consistent, you know, unfortunately, and COVID challenged everybody, but even pre-COVID, um, you know, community orgs, we just, we got to stay consistent and we got to do the work and show up all the time, like every time. Because we kind of, sometimes we look around and we're like, where did they go? Well, what, what happened to them? Like, it's, it's, it gets a little... It gets a little tricky out there, um, but yeah, that's my trick. Well, and to add to Kalapuni, let's talk about burnout. Because like Kalapuni said, we're embedded in these communities. It's it's not like we come home, take off our Samoan or Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander coat and go to normal. We go home and we're still Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander. And we are beholden to these communities. So we put a lot more effort and time into it. And, you know, Kapuni said, sometimes she turns around and it's like, well, where did that community-based organization go? Well, it's really difficult when there's only a handful of them that are doing the work for a community that spans the state and that requires so much time and energy and is oftentimes poorly funded. And, um, Recently, we went and we visited Auntie Jessie on the Big Island, and she was showing us her territory or in 
I mean, you know, not her territory, but the area that she um, that she services, it can take her all day to get from one side of that area to the next. And yet she continues to do that. And that's true of many of us. Um, and so I think, you know, it's it's not only pick and choose, but remind yourself that the energy that you have will determine how long you are able to do this work. And so you should be picky because not everybody offering you coin is worth your time or energy or is going to produce the solutions that you are looking for. And I know for those who do this, including myself, that can be really hard because when you don't have money, it feels odd to say no to someone who's offering you money. So just to add on to that point, because I was just thinking it's, it's a true statement. It's really, you know, you look around and the landscape is oftentimes changing. Mahalo for that. So basically it's, the bottom line is it's really our table. You just think it's yours and we're taking it back, <laughs> right? I mean, you think it's your table, fine, but we're not going away, right? Right. Um, so it's, I guess it's instead of being uh, apologetic for our existence and being like, thank you for this handout, right? It's like, actually, that's not good enough. You need to check all these boxes because this is what we need, right? So I guess it's kind of like changing the perspective and the, 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 the attitude instead of always being used to being an inconvenience, right? Like, you know, this is our homeland. We're not going away. You gotta, you gotta put up, put up with it. You know, work with us. So I have some other questions. If folks um, want to um, put their questions in the chat or in the um, Q and A feature, so let's see here. Are you challenged by organizations that get funding or set policy for communities? that they have never served or communicated with. A lot of organizations get funding on the back of, on the back of the efforts of CBOs, community-based organizations putting their work in jeopardy. Well, that's a loaded question. Um, so there was a recent article that <laughs> um, talked about um, Community health are uh, health equity tourist, and basically what it what it um, talked about was non native indigenous people coming in to indigenous native spaces, doing work, not being collaborative, taking credit for that work, and then advancing their careers because of it. This is nothing new. We have seen this since the beginning of contact with foreigners within the Pacific. And so I think this is where, again, uh, Kaapuni is talking about gatekeeping. And I know oftentimes that is associated with like, oh no, nobody should do that. Um, but this is where we need to be protective of those things that we consider to be near and dear. And I also think that it is completely appropriate for those of us from these communities to call it out. Um, oftentimes we sit quietly because we think, or we've been taught that, well, some work is better than no work and at least they're amplifying our struggles. Are they though? Or are they benefiting from it? And have they presented your struggles in a narrative that is true to what is happening to you? Or have those struggles been funneled through a lens that no longer represents you or your community? And I think those are important questions. And I think also, again, this goes back to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I know we've been trained that there are people who are smarter than us and they don't look like us. And therefore we should just nod our head quietly 
and say, yes, yes, thank you so much. But no, I am just as smart and just as able as you are. And I don't need anyone translating what I have said. What I need is for appropriate assistance to be given, supported. And when the work is already being done, please don't correct, take credit for that which you have not done or are not a part of. Um, for academics, we call that plagiarism. And you get kicked out of school and blacklisted for that. <laughs> um, in the real world, unfortunately, we don't have that type of stuff. Um, but we do need to call it out and we need to and we need to take ownership of what's ours. That's my thoughts. I'm I'm just gonna agree with Telly on this one. And and you, you said it so nicely, Telly, because this is this is such a sore spot for Papa Colea. So if for anyone who doesn't know, um, our homestead is located, we're five minutes up the road from downtown Honolulu. We are next to Punchbowl Cemetery. And so we're the only Hawaiian homestead in urban Honolulu. So we are famous for kind of being the check the box Hawaiian community being served um, no, to our knowledge and not to our knowledge. You know, we found out after the fact that other people have been funded to serve Papukalea, you know, kupuna or students um, after the grant ended. And we were like, well, really, what did you do for our keiki? And so this, this has always been a, a hard part for us. Um, but, um, you know, but I think like Telly was saying, right? So as the community-based nonprofit, as Kula, we say, well, this is us and this is what we do. And right, just like Telly was saying, is we have the capacity to do the same services. And it's, you know, maybe if you're willing to partner with us, that's fine, but we can't watch all of them. We have gotten better over the years about anytime anyone is putting proposal money in to serve our Hawaiian homesteads, we're like, okay, well, who are you? And what are you doing? Um, but again, it's, you gotta watch for that. And that's part of, you know, I don't know if gatekeeping is the term, but that's part of making sure if you're asking for funding to serve our people, then serve our people. And, and it's fine, right? We're, we are not saying that we're the only people that can serve, serve public land. We don't wanna say that at all. But if you are saying that you're gonna serve our community, then we're gonna hold you to it. That becomes our job. Right to make sure that you do what you say you're gonna do. So yeah, but that's it, it's happened and, and it's unfortunate, but that's also part of building your CBO, building your capacity, right? Doing like Telly said and throw the crazy scary bios out there and be like, we can do this too, guys. Um, and, and do for self, because that's the goal, right? That's the goal. But yeah, I love Telly's bio. Stop. Okay, so I'm gonna borrow something. No kako, na kako. For us, by us. And I think that is something we all need to be doing. Is that if you're going to do something for our community, then that something should be done by us and with us. And thank you, Kapuni. I'm gonna get comfortable with that bio. One way or the other, I will get comfortable with it. <laughs> no, I was gonna say. I think. Telly, you need to hold a workshop for all of us that's attending this webinar to do a bio just like yours, because <laughs> it's pretty impressive. It's only because we're your grassroots friends that we know that there's another side of you that we're like, what? <laughs> but that's okay. We will march forward with that. <laughs> we're going to put that out there. Okay, so we're kind of coming to the end. I just want to put it out there. If folks want to, again, have any comments, mana'o, questions, um, please feel free to put it in the chat now or in the Q&A section. You can also ask them anonymously. There's an option there. Um, but, you know, go ahead, Telly. As you say, I see a question that says, do you think there's really a desire to have you at the table as equals? especially when your knowledge of challenging and voicing challenge is considered off-putting. I, um, I wanna answer that honestly, and I, I don't think there is a desire at times to have me at a table because um, as human beings, we are creatures of habit and the system has been going the same way for a long, uh, long period of time. And so change is hard and it is going to be fought. And 
Um, again, this comes back with being comfortable with being uncomfortable. I know that um, my presence is difficult for some people. I know that when I talk about race and race relations, and when I call a spade a spade, um, that can be considered off-putting because we've been taught that um, good girls don't call those things out. They very quietly just nod and say, yes, yes. And that's true of Native Hawaiian and Pacific Island community members. We are being told that we just need to be grateful for whatever is being dealt to us and that we should be accommodating and appreciative. And how dare we ask that it be in language, culturally appropriate and engaging. Um, I think the best example I can use for that is during vaccines, we had certain providers who would go out into Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. They would not engage with the community. They would pop up a tent and they would be there for eight hours and they would have very little community participation, if any. And then after that, they would say, well, we were there and the community didn't want our services. They didn't show up. And then when we would ask, well, what did you do to engage the community? Did you talk to leaders or community-based organizations? Did you collaborate? Did you ask if the time that you were there was acceptable to the community? And oftentimes, almost 100% of the time, the answer was no. We just knew that they had a need and we wanted to address it. And we thought that we knew better than that community. So we just showed up. Would you show up if you saw a medical provider standing on the side of the road and you didn't see anyone that you knew or recognized? Our communities have a history of being mistreated, sadly, by government agencies and Western medicine. Recognizing that historical context then gives you guidance on how to actually engage, communicate, and set up outreach that will be well-received. So do they like having me at the table? No. Am I gonna get up and walk away from the table? No. Um, are they gonna have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable with me there? Yes. So that's my answer to that. And thank you for that question. So do you have, Lisa. Um, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Kapuni, did you wanna say something? Um, well, just just to add to Telly and and you know for for us and our definitely our leaders, our executive director and associate director, um, you know if if you're on a table, you have to remember who you're representing, right? So you know if if you know Adrian Dillard, um, she has like facial expressions that are really special, and she'll like let you know if she thinks that you're crazy. Um, but for them, they walk into these tables and into these spaces, like Telly is saying that it's uncomfortable, but you have to be empowered by the communities and the kupuna that you represent, right? So they go, you have to go into these spaces that can become uncomfortable. And we know that the people, other people on the table may not be excited to see us and have us engage, um, but we're not here to make them comfortable. We're here to advocate for the kupuna and the communities that we serve. And it, it is a tricky space, but I think, you know, if anyone's out there and, you start to feel that, you just have to remember to be empowered by your community and the people that are gonna benefit by your presence in these uncomfortable situations. So I'm not sure if the person who asked that is starting to feel those vibes, um, but yeah, just you just have to be grounded, right? When you enter these spaces and just remember why we're here, guys. Like, <laughs> that's always helpful. Mahalo. So I know um, we're about coming to a close and I do see some questions. We'll try to see if we can get them answered in the follow-up email. Um, 
And then you can always email us after. But I did want to kind of end like on a positive note. Um, not that it has all been negative, but um, you know, end on like a, if there was one thing someone had to walk away today from this webinar, what would it be? Or what advice would you give to someone to keep moving forward? We'll just okay. call you guys. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, so I, I think what I would say is, um, I have been privileged to read a lot of Pacific Islander scholars as well as Native Hawaiians. And um, the first scholars to write about Pacific greatness were Albert Wendt and Apele Ha'ofa. Um, and our Sea of Islands is often one that is quoted. And so I think if I were to say something to you today, it would be recognize who you are and those who came before you and the struggles and sacrifices that were made to bring you here to this moment. Um, you were not brought during this time to be small. You are here to create change, to support your communities and to lead. And um, you may feel alone at that table and you may get those vibes that you're not wanted there, but we want you. We need you and we, we're there, all of us, because one Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander at the table creates more seats for every single one of us. So, sorry, I, I just, um, I think back to how special reading those things were to me because I was raised on the continent where we were told that Pacific Islanders got into canoes, went fishing with all their supplies, got lost during a storm, and then landed somewhere else. And that's how we populated the Pacific. But what I know today is that's not true. We went with intent. We were educated, knowledgeable, and we, um, and, we survived and thrived. And when foreigners entered our waters, we were not simply sitting around in darkness waiting to be saved. We had thriving communities that did not need their assistance. They needed ours. So don't forget that. And uh, that's what I would say to you. So. Um, I, I think probably my uh, ask would be do the work and like Tully was saying, connect to the net, right? None of us are doing this alone. Kula is a small nonprofit in Papakolea on Oahu, um, but look around and, and you got to connect, right? I think a lot of what we, we haven't been able to do historically is that, you know, we, we were kind of very siloed and, and you do this and well, you just do this and you just do this. And um, COVID especially created an opportunity where we had to rely on one another. And it's become an amazing partnership and time where you gotta connect to other orgs and other communities um, and we have to all move forward. And I think for any CBOs, any, any grassroots guys out there, um, look for a hui, right? Like we here and just join the hui, get on the canoe guys and we all going somewhere. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, I don't know if, you know, don't, it's, it's not a scary thing, right? We just jump in and hang on and we get to it together. But mahalo everyone. Thanks, you guys. This has really been a fun webinar to do with both of you together. <laughs> Tell you all have me in tears twice. Oh my gosh. But next time you come on, I get your, I gotta be ready for your bio and a box of Kleenex. What the heck? <laughs> so um yeah, mahalo for joining us today. And um if you can tell you 
send me an email with the books that you mentioned. So in the follow-up email, we can send it to all the registrants. And then I just want to mahalo the registrants that um, those that joined us today. Um, we'll try to get your questions answered in the follow-up email. And then those of us that are in going to join us via the recording, you can always email us later afterwards. Um, the next uh, webinar is going to be the 28th. So um, for those that don't know, we have one every second and fourth Friday of the month, unless it falls on a holiday. The next one that's coming up, um, we're actually having um, some young students present on the need for or the lack of um, occupational therapists and optometrists, um, especially those that want to become one in our native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander. Um, so they're going to discuss a little bit more about that on the 28th. Um, we won't be having any webinars in our November because they actually both fall on holidays. So the next one will be in December. So again, uh, Malama Pono, uh, I just want to say mahalo to Kaimi Pono Hanohano and Kamuala Kala'i for being my kako in the background, my Zoom tech there. And then um, Malama Kikahi Kikahi and we'll keep in touch. And then if Kapuni and Tele can stay on just for a little bit, that would be great. So. Mahalo for joining us, Ahuiho.